Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Delta Days in the Bronx, a community conversation. My name is Althea Kitchens, and I am the president of the Bronx Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. For those of you who are new to us, I will share a little information about our organization. Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated was founded on January 13, 1913, by 22 collegiate women at Howard University. Delta is a private, not-for-profit organization whose purpose is to provide assistance and support through established programs and local communities throughout the world. The organization is a sisterhood of predominantly Black college-educated women, and since its founding, more than 300,000 women have joined the organization through over 1,000 chapters in 11 countries around the world, making Delta the largest Black Greek-lettered organization. The Bronx Alumni Chapter has been bringing Delta's national programs to the Bronx community since 1968. These programs are focused on the sorority's five-point programmatic thrust, which consists of educational development, economic development, international awareness and involvement, physical and mental health, and political awareness and involvement. Today, and over the past couple of days, we are discussing topics under political awareness and involvement, partnering with our elected officials and other community leaders to spread awareness of issues in our community and how to work together to help build a better Bronx. To hear more details about the purpose of this forum, I will turn it over to our social action co-chair, Janelle Boyd. Good morning and welcome. My name is Janelle Boyd and I am the co-chair of the Social Action Committee. On behalf of the Social Action Committee, we welcome you to our second annual Delta Days in the Bronx. Delta Days in the Bronx is a forum for Bronxites to learn about issues that are impacting our communities while learning more about the legislative process. It is modeled after our national program, Delta Days in the Nation's Capital, which was instituted in 1989 by the National Social Action Commission of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated as an annual legislative conference that is attended by our members from across the country. Its purpose is to increase members' involvement in the national public policy making process. This year, our live session will focus on the newly instituted ranked choice voting, small business services, and an update on COVID-19. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to visit our YouTube channel at Bronx Alumni Chapter DST where you will find videos about surviving COVID-19, educational disparities, elder care, and redistricting. We hope that after these sessions, you will continue to seek opportunities to gain more information on the issues that are important to you so that we can protect the health and well-being of our communities. Additionally, it is our hope that you will learn something new and more importantly, share what you have learned with the family member, neighbor, or a friend. Together, we can uplift our community to build a better Bronx. We hope that you enjoy our Delta Days in the Bronx topics and thank you once again for joining us today. I will now turn it over to the chair of the Social Action Committee, Teresa Lanlotta. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We will now have a live greetings from some of our elected officials 
beginning with our very own New York State Assembly Speaker, Carl Hasty. I wanted to come in personally uh, and, and speak and not uh, by video. Um, one, I wanna personally you know, thank the Deltas um, for their continued commitment to uh, social engagement, social justice, and just uh, trying to make the Bronx uh, the best that, that uh, it can be. I've always said as an elected official, um, we can only do so much, but it's really our community-based organizations our churches that are really the backbone of our community. So I really wanna thank the Deltas for their commitment uh, uh, to the Bronx. Um, I was given a list of things to, uh, to talk about. I, I won't uh, talk too long on them, but I think they are very important uh, subjects um, uh, that uh, were, were sent to me uh, to, to discuss. Uh, we all know that this last uh, year and, and, and uh, a couple of months has probably been some of the most difficult ones uh, in, in all of our lifetimes. Uh, the last, uh, there are not many people uh, that were here with the last time there was uh, a, um, a national pandemic, or I'd say a worldwide pandemic as the one that we, we have faced. And we all know that we've lost uh, loved ones. I'm sure some of us on this call uh, have had COVID. I actually, um, uh, I, I had COVID uh, in, in March of this year um, after I received my first vaccination. Uh, thankfully, I had very mild symptoms. I'll say on a scale of one to 10, there might've been a two. I may have had one rough day. I just had lower back pain and I was fatigued, but I had no shortness of breath. Um, I had my taste and smell. I, Luckily, I was able to quarantine and still work on the state budget for my Albany residents. Um, but it just, you know, for those of you who haven't had COVID, I hope you don't get it. But it is something that when you have it, you know it. And it's, uh, it's something that I, I felt I'd never felt before in my life. And my doctor credits me getting the, um, the first vaccination shot. I got exposed 13 days after my first uh, uh, vaccination shot as the reason why my symptoms weren't uh, that severe. So um, I'm hoping that uh, people, particularly black people were still uh, lagging far behind in terms of uh, getting uh, vaccinated. Um, and I know people are nervous about vaccines, but, and listen, it didn't prevent me from getting it, but it prevented me, I'm sure, from getting uh, much uh, sicker than, uh, than, I, than I was. So I'm also gonna make this a, a public service announcement urging uh, people to get vaccinated and to continue to tell those who we care about uh, to get vaccinated, particularly the younger people, um, you know, sometimes uh, think they're invincible and the, uh, the variants that are circulating now uh, are much more potent than the one that we were dealing with uh, with last year. Um, you know, and, I, and all the other things I can kind of sum up, uh, you know, in this year's budget, uh, this is probably the greatest budget, uh, maybe in the history of the state, but absolutely in my 21 years in the legislature and, and six years as a speaker, we are fully funding um, uh, the CFE, the Campaign for Fiscal Equity. The federal government gave us $13 billion um, in part of the, um, the uh, COVID relief package. So we can finally start to really invest in education as we will. Uh, that, as we should have. And also there's gonna be a, a lot of regression. Uh, um, my own daughter who is, a, um, uh, is an honest student, uh, she struggled mightily with remote learning. And so there is gonna be some regression. So, regression, so thankfully um, there's funding for that. Uh, when we look at senior care, we know that many of the people who uh, perished under uh, COVID were our loved ones in, in nursing homes in hospitals, so we did a lot of legislation uh, trying to um, make uh, nursing homes more responsible, more, uh, uh, um, I'd say, uh, the ratios between uh, staff and patient uh, ratios, uh, the funding and uh, for-profit nursing homes, uh, that a certain percentage of that funding has to go towards uh, patient care. Um, when we look at small businesses, we know that, uh, you know, New York is the uh, 
business capital of the world and, and no one suffered more than uh, we did with COVID. But uh, thankfully the federal government did their share and then the, the state, we also in the budget uh, put forth a billion dollars to help uh, small businesses uh, who need assistance. Um, if anybody has a question, um, they can reach out to uh, the New York State Department of Economic Development or they can reach out to my office if you know of a small business, particularly here in the Bronx that uh, may need some help. There are grants available from 5,000 5, uh, to 50,000 that can help people from payroll to rent, uh, to reopening, to whatever it is that they may feel that they need to open. Uh, we want to get back to normalcy. I think we're starting to see um, uh, the end of the tunnel. Uh, the more that people vaccinated in New York State, um, we now have some of the lowest infection rates and also some of the highest um, vaccination rates, again, outside of uh, you know communities of, of color. Um, a lot of things are now open, but we're still asking people to be still be uh, conscientious about uh, the safety of others. Mass mandates are being, uh, I'd say, being lessened. And there's some instances outright if, that if you've been vaccinated, uh, um, it's comfortable now for people uh, to gather together if people have been vaccinated. But, uh, you know, we can't, uh, you know, because of HIPAA rules and things like that, it's very hard. So it's really an honest system. So I would say we should still all take, uh, you know, care and diligence. I'm still doing that uh, in the assembly chamber. I'm still um, uh, asking that uh, legislators and staff still wear masks because I, I want to make sure that people are, are safe and uh, we're not uh, um, spreading uh, uh, COVID. But I, like I said, the end of the, I think we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And then the last thing that I think I wanna talk about um, and like I said, uh, you have a Sora on here, uh, 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 Ms. Nicole Yearwood, who uh, has been a, a devoted census person uh, since as long as I can remember, I think since as, almost as long as I've been in office. And so Nikki, you started when you were about five. So uh, you were doing this um, at a very uh, young age. Um, but we here in New York, we lost one, uh, we're gonna lose one congressional seat under redistricting. We fell 89 people short of um, not losing a seat. And that would have been the first time since 1960. Uh, uh, every year, every 10 years since 1960, uh, New York has been losing. In 1960, we were the, the most populated state. We are, will now be number four behind California, Texas, and Florida. We'll still have the fourth highest number of members of Congress, but when you start to lose uh, members of Congress, you lose clout. And so um, that means we'll be a short one um, member of Congress. But also uh, in, in drawing new congressional lines, all state legislators and state Senate lines will have to be redrawn uh, as well. This year there will be, uh, it's an independent redistricting commission and how that works is they will present maps to the legislature uh, and if the legislature likes the maps, we can vote and pass them. If we don't like the maps, we can vote them down twice and then draw the lines ourselves. So it should be an interesting uh, time in, uh, uh, in terms of uh, re reapportionment uh, and redistricting uh, next year. Uh, and I think that's, I think I've covered everything on the list. But again, like I said, I really want to thank the, the Deltas for their hard work nationally. Um, and uh, but but even more importantly, locally here and helping me, which I think the Bronx is the greatest place in the world uh, to live and be. And I just want to, again, thank the Deltas for all your hard work and commitment to the Bronx. Thank you, Speaker Hasty. And now we will have greetings from our very own Deputy Borough President, Marika Scott McFadden. Thank you so much. Um, um, it's a pleasure to follow those the remarks from our speaker, uh, my former boss. Um, and now I'm the deputy borough president. And I too think the Bronx is one of the best places to live. And we often refer to it as the as God's country. And so um, I'll continue re making remarks and I'll thank 
um, the Delta's uh, alumni chapter in the Bronx for everything that you do and inviting me to, to speak. I know you're gonna hear from a lot of people, so I won't um, speak long, but I will um, focus my remarks on the borough president's um, office and what we've been, um, what we would like to highlight right now in terms of uh, COVID. And I know that's gonna be one of the topics that uh, we discussed today. During um, the beginnings of the pandemic, the Bronx was um, one of the hardest hit places. And we know due to a lot of factors, we lost a, a, a great number of people, a lot of elders in our communities, and, and just generally had bad um, uh, and, and results of the pandemic. So we had a lot, we, we, we lost a lot of people. But um, one of the things that we feel at the borough president's office is that we that we there is an example of Bronxites not um, having the opportunity to properly mourn, to to properly um, give honor to those people that they have um, lost. So the borough president's office has um, created uh, a memorial page uh, and you can reach that going to our the borough president's office the uh, website there'll be there links and we encourage everyone who has a member uh, someone that they would like to memorialize to be able to put up pictures put up um, statements um, let people know that the Bronx and Bronx sites who were lost during the pandemic um, have not been forgotten. Um, and we've created also a social media acknowledgement and really um, an encouragement of folks to go out and be vaccinated. So we are asking people to post on their social media um, why they vax. If you've been vaccinated and you want to say, well, I'm vaccinated, I'm being vaxxed for my, my parents or to get back to um, you know, uh, the norm, I uh, we're asking that everyone do so and hashtag why I vax uh, V A X and that's something that we want to really highlight and make sure that um, we're looking at our communities in the Bronx that's been so severely um, impacted and of people people uh, of color who've been so severely impacted by COVID and its disparate outcomes that we both remember why those that have been lost and then also encourage our, everyone to take this, this, this um, lifeline, if you would, um, into their own hands and, and become vaccinated. I know I, um, I've been vaccinated and it was really a surprise to me just how much of a weight it felt that was lifted. Uh, off my shoulders and in terms of the anxiety around possibly getting infected, possibly um, bringing an, um, the infection to your family members. Um, and, and once you get in vaccinated, if you have the experience that I did, and I, I think that you will, that you will um, have a tremendous weight lifted and you will have uh, the opportunity to predict better outcomes if you get um, COVID and that's the the caveat doesn't say you're not going to get it you just have better outcomes and we are in the Bronx are praying for better outcomes um, for Bronx sites I know we're going to be talking about um, voting and um, small business and um, all of those are, are tremendous um, topics to the Bronx there you know e equally um, issues that we in the Bronx look a lot, look to, we wanna support our small businesses in various ways. We wanna make sure that um, small businesses continue throughout the pandemic. You know, some of us really chose to um, go local, go to our local um, vendors and not those, the national brands to go and, um, you know, whether it's a holiday or birthday or Christmas, we, we chose to, to buy and support small businesses. And as always, um, uh, bringing people out to participate civically is important and, and, and something that can't be overlooked. So 
for me and as a representative from of our president's office, um, we are really excited about all the things that, that you guys are gonna talk about today. I wanna personally thank you for inviting me to be a part of that conversation. And I hope that everyone will, um, will participate, will get vaxxed um, and, uh, and participate with all of the suggestions that you're gonna to hear today because I just, I know that they are gonna be powerful, powerful um, suggestions that are gonna bring back to the community a, a lot of um, a, a lot of equity if we do what we need to do. Um, so I thank you uh, for having me and I don't know, how do you transition on these virtual things, but that's my transition. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Deputy Borough President. Thank you. Um, so, and now we were gonna have a live um, actually a recorded greeting from Senator uh, Chuck Schumer. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure to join you for Delta Days in the Bronx. I wanna thank the Bronx alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta leadership for inviting me to speak to you. As you know, I love the Deltas. When the ladies in red come down to DC, I roll out the red carpet for them and you visit me every year. It's one of my favorite meetings. Now we have to do it by Zoom, but getting to see the ladies in red stroll into the Capitol, as I said, is always one of the highlights of my year. For over a hundred years, Deltas have been at the forefront of the fight for racial justice, economic justice, societal justice in New York and across the country. That's why I wanted to take some time this evening to share with you what we did in the American Rescue Plan. The American Rescue Plan is not just a rescue plan, it's a representation of the values of this democratic majority. And as the leader of the democratic majority, the first one from New York and your New York Senator, I used my position to make sure this bill benefited New Yorkers with particular focus on communities of color. We got enough vaccines for everyone who wants one and put communities of color at the top of the list, not the bottom, to get the vaccines. We sent out emergency pandemic checks we expanded the child tax care credit and the earned income tax credit, which will take one half of the young children out of poverty this year in America and in New York. We provided assistance to small businesses, nonprofits and churches. I was particularly proud to make sure churches were included. We provided food and nutrition assistance. We gave money to the states for rent forgiveness and provided mortgage forbearance for homeowners. And we are not stopping there. We are gonna pass the American Jobs Family Plan, and I promise I will use my power as your majority leader to make sure those bills are equally focused on communities of color. As long as I'm Senator for the great state of New York, the ladies in red will always have a seat at the table. Nicole Yearwood. Nicole Yearwood is an organizer for Rank the Vote NYC. Since 2018, she has worked to educate communities about plans for the 2020 census. For almost nine years, she was director of government relations for a nonprofit that provides free programs in New York City parks, where she raised more than six million in capital and discretionary funding and conducted workshops that taught community groups how to build relationships with their elected representatives. In 2015, she founded EducatedVoter.net, aimed at fostering civic participation. Nicole shares nonpartisan voter education information on social media platforms and provides civic education services. She received her Master of Public Administration degree and a BA in Sociology from the State University of New York at Binghamton. Good morning. Before I begin sharing my screen, I'm gonna place a link in the chat 
to our mock election. The link is going to take you to a page asking for your name and email address. You can enter any series of letters or characters you like, and then just hit submit and you'll be taken to the mock election where you'll be asked to rank um, New York City's most influential woman past and present. You'll be asked to rank up to five with the first column being your most favorite to the fifth column being your least favorite. If you have any questions regarding this presentation, please place them in the Q&A bar and I will address them at the end of the presentation. So just a recap on how we arrived at ranked choice voting. So how did we get here? So in 2009, the public advocate and comptroller candidates did not receive 40% of the vote in the New York City primary. So what happens when a citywide candidate does not obtain 40% of the vote? In the past, we went to a runoff election, which was basically a full election, totally run again, a couple of weeks after the primary. It's very expensive, of course, because we're running an election all over again. And usually they have very low turnout. In this particular year, the election was between 13 and $15 million and turnout was extremely low. And that prompted a debate on the use of runoff elections. In 2010, then council member Gail Brewer introduced the first ranked choice voting bill in the New York City Council. In 2010 and in 2018, the New York City Charter Revision Commissions discussed a ranked choice voting um, for local elections, but determined they needed additional time. But in 2019, the New York City Charter Revision Commission voted 14 to 1 to place ranked choice voting on the ballot before New Yorkers. It was ballot question one on the November 2019 general election ballot and received 75% of the vote in favor of RCV. And it was scheduled to begin in 2021. And now we're here. So why are we here? So in this year in particular, because of term limits, there are a lot of open seats in our New York City government. More than 30 of our 51 city council members are term limited out of office. Our mayor, as well as our comptroller, and four out of five borough presidents are term limit out of office. Of course, without incumbents, a lot of people felt like they have a better chance of being elected to office. And so we had a wealth of diverse candidates that have stepped up to the plate. In addition to the term limits, we also have a robust campaign finance system where contributions from New York City residents are matched six to one and eight to one respectively. So of course, on the previous system of voting, you definitely have a likelihood of splitting the vote in these elections. Under the old system, a council member was elected with a simple plurality, whoever received the most votes won. But in races where we have 10, nine, some cases 12, in my own council district, 14 people are running. Someone could win with as little as 20% of the vote. But that also means that 80% of the voters selected someone else. So what's new? As of right now, in our local primary and special elections, for the offices of city council, borough president, public advocate, comptroller, and mayor, you are now able to rank up to five candidates in order of preference, including a write-in. Runoff elections are now eliminated and candidates will need to win with at least 50% of the vote, actually 50% plus one or a majority of the vote. So election day is June 22nd, but early voting begins in just one week on Saturday, June 12th. The last day to register unfortunately has passed. That was May 28th. The last day to change your address if you were already registered was June Second, but polls open one week from today, June 12th, and you can visit vote.nyc to find your early, uh, early voting poll site, which is going to be different more than likely from your election day poll site, but you can find that information at vote.nyc. 
So what is ranked choice voting? So on the right of the screen, there's a sample ballot there and you see five columns. So let's talk about your first choice. So the narrative says the first choice is the candidate that you love. But of course, if you don't know someone on the ballot, you actually may not like anyone. So how would you make that determination? So we start, we say, let's look at the issues. What policy issues are important to you? And where do the candidates stand on those issues? What values do they have? Do they share your values and beliefs on these positions? And so that's how you can figure out who is going to be my number one candidate based on that metric. You say, where do they stand on the issues that I believe in, the things that I care about? And maybe you might even give a contribution to this campaign. You may volunteer on this campaign for this candidate. And you may even tell your friends and family to vote for that candidate. That is your first choice candidate. And you should identify that person by shading in the oval in that first choice column. That is where you mark your favorite candidate. And we see here that that is candidate C. Then you have your second choice. So we say that's the candidate that you like, but really who it is, that is that backup. Should something happen to your first choice candidate, that second choice candidate is a solid backup to that first choice. They share your values, your beliefs on the issues that you care about. They would do a good job representing the district. Again, they're a solid backup to your first choice. And we see that that is candidate B identified in the second choice column and the oval is shaded in that corresponds to candidate B's row. Then you have your third and fourth choices. Now, again, these are backups to the first and second should something happen to them for any reason. They may not align with you on all the things you believe in and all the issues that you care about, but they probably check off most boxes for you and you identify them in the third and fourth column. So we see that that's candidate E and D respectively in the third and fourth choice columns. And then we have the fifth choice candidate. And we say here that that's the candidate that you can stand. But a lot of times that gets a few chuckles because they say I can stand, but what does that really mean? So we say, listen, if something happens to the first four, again, that fifth choice candidate doesn't check off all your boxes. They may check off some, but at least you know if all else failed, if your first four were eliminated, this fifth choice candidate could still represent the district well. And that's identified here in this example as candidate A, we see that they're marked in the fifth choice column in the row that corresponds to candidate A. And so here we also have a cute video that shows you how ranked choice voting works. Hi, I'm Mahir, and welcome to my bodega. As you may know, New York City has a new way to vote in special and primary elections. So, how does ranked choice voting work? The next time you vote in a city election, instead of choosing just one candidate, you can rank them all from your first choice to your fifth. Here's how it works. Let's say my bodega is picking its featured snack of the month. So many choices! Which one should I feature? This customer ranks Parker Pretzels as her top favorite. She also ranks her second choice, Mr. Chips, third choice, Chichi Chicharrones, fourth choice, Gladys Gummies, and fifth choice, Poppy Popcorn. Other customers rank their choices as well. If Parker Pretzels is the favorite choice and wins more than 50% of all the first ranked choices, then Parker Pretzels is the winner and is featured as the snack of the month. However, if no snack gets more than 50%, then the least popular snack is eliminated. Sorry, Figgy Bars. The remaining second ranked choices from customers who chose Figgy Bars are redistributed. So if customers chose Chips and Chicharrones as second choices, then those two snacks receive additional votes. The new totals are counted and the process repeats until there's a winner of the final two. Congrats, Poppy Popcorn, you're the bodega snack favorite. Back in the real world, before it's time to vote for humans, visit rankthevotenyc.org for more information. Thank you, New York City, for voting and for making these special and primary elections your elections. So what is your ballot going to look like? So 
The sample ballot is actually out. If you've already received your absentee ballot, you know exactly what your ballot is going to look like. But this is just to kind of give you an example. All of the ranked choice voting elections are going to be kept together. And so I want to be very clear about that. And so you can see here that you see the different options, you see the different columns that correspond to the choices. So you have first through fifth. Um, for instance, in this example, you have the first through the fourth because there are only three people running and a write-in, which makes the fourth column. And you see here, you can still also put in a write-in candidate if you choose. And you would just shade in the oval that corresponds to where you want to rank them. Now, in our actual ballot, these are going to be either on the back side or an additional page, but our ballots are definitely multiple pages. You're going to need to review them back and front to ensure that you are voting in all of the elections and the races that are available to you this particular cycle. And I believe that the council and another race might be on the back or on an additional page because there are so many candidates in some of the races. And so here again, let's say my favorite candidate for mayor is Emerson Brooks. I'm gonna go in the first choice column. I'm gonna shade in the oval that corresponds to Emerson Brooks because that's my favorite candidate, that's my guy. And so again, that is where you put them in the first choice column. And then you have your second choice, again, the backup candidate. Let's say that's Jess Allen for me. I'm gonna go in that second choice column. I'm gonna put Jess Allen. And then I'm going to continue until I've selected all five of my choices. So before we discuss how the counting of the rounds happens, let's take a look at the results of the mock election. So we see here that 615 votes have been cast in this election. That means that 308 votes are required to win the election. We see here that round one of nine no one has the 308 votes required to win. Round one actually represents a tabulation of all of the first choice votes that were cast in this election. So no one received the 308 votes required to win. Now we're going to go into counting of rounds. The counting of the rounds means that the person in last place will be eliminated and their votes will be redistributed based on the second choices on those ballots. So for example, so just also want to be clear about this. This is not a random redistribution. Votes don't automatically go to a particular candidate, whether that's the first, second, third, fourth, or fifth candidate. It's not like that. It is based on the second choices on the ballot. So we see here, for instance, 12 people voted for Mary J. Blige. Because she has the least amount of votes, she's going to be eliminated first. These 12 votes are going to be redistributed based on how these people who picked her first pick their second choices. So for instance, I could have voted for Mary J. Blige as my first choice and picked Eleanor Roosevelt as my second choice. My vote would go from Mary J. Blige to Eleanor Roosevelt. You could have selected Mary J. Blige as your first choice and picked Shirley Chisholm as your second choice. Your vote would go from Mary J. Blige to Shirley Chisholm. And that will continue for all, be the same way for all 12 votes. Whoever they picked as their second choice, the vote will go to that person. Also, in New York City, for our elections, we will continue these rounds of counting until we get to the top two candidates, even if someone reaches the majority threshold before we reach the top two candidates, they will continue with counting. here, how the votes are moving. And so we see here that Shirley Chisholm is the winner with 320 votes. Ruth Bader Ginsburg came in second place with 278 votes. And we have 16 votes that were exhausted. What this means is that there were only 16 people who did not have Shirley Chisholm or Ruth Bader Ginsburg somewhere on their ballot. So the counting of the rounds only kicks in if no candidate receives more than 50% of the first choice votes. So as you just saw in the example, now has Shirley Chisholm 
be, received 308 first choice votes, it would not have been a ranked choice voting election. Shirley Chisholm would have been declared the winner if she received them in the first round. The official winner will not be declared until all of the votes are counted. So this means early votes, election day votes, affidavit, military and absentee ballots. So an official winner is not gonna be declared in our primary for at least two to three weeks, but preliminary results will be shared after election day at the Board of Elections website, vote.nyc. So for instance, on election night, we will see tabulation of the first choice votes from early voting and election day and additional results will be shared throughout the process, but the final results will not be determined for at least two to three weeks. And that's really because absentee ballots can be mailed and postmarked as late as election day. And the Board of Elections has to wait for those to come in to count them. And if there's an issue with an absentee ballot or actually the envelope, they have to allow someone to cure that. So they have to have time for that process and then for them to be returned. In addition, the round by round vote totals will be released to the general public. Again, that will be available at vote.nyc. As we discussed earlier, there have been two special elections in the Bronx. And so during those special elections and after they were finished, the vote totals were at the Board of Elections website, vote.nyc. So why should voters use their rankings? So this is giving, clearly this is giving voters more choices. Now, instead of going in and voting for one person, you now get to rank up to five candidates. Again, you only have one vote, but you can rank up to five people. It is also giving you more power in an election because now candidates can't just target the people who they think are definitely going to support them because they most likely will need a few second, maybe even some third choice votes to put them over the threshold. So now, even if you have a favorite candidate Another candidate may approach you and say, you know what, can you rank me someplace else on your ballot? So now candidates have to reach out to a wider audience and that gives voters more power. Even if your favorite candidate does not win, you still have a say in who is ultimately elected to represent that district. You can also vote your conscience without worrying about wasting your vote. If you really like a candidate who is quote unquote an underdog or seems less viable than other candidates, you can still rank that candidate and then you have four other options that you can rank. And of course, ranking a second, third, fourth, or fifth choice will never hurt your favorite candidate. So here's some frequently asked questions. How many candidates do I rank? So no matter how many people are in a race, you only have up to five rankings, but you can also rank four, three, two, or you can still vote for one person if you like. Do I have to use all five rankings? So again, the answer is no. Your vote will still count if you go in and you rank one person, two, three, four, you only have up to five. But this is something that I would like for you all to take into consideration. You can still vote for one person if you like, but if that one person is eliminated from the race, for any reason, your vote will have no place to go and therefore will be exhausted. It will not be in the other rounds of counting. So one of the things I say to people is that if you want your ballot to stay active for as long as possible, you should rank a couple of candidates. Now, of course, never rank someone you absolutely don't want to win but I would encourage you to vote for more than one. And again, let's look at the mock election as an example. If you only voted for Mary J. Blige in that mock election, which I know is impossible because we asked you to rank and we don't let you move forward without choosing five. But let's say for instance, you only voted for Mary J. Blige. She was eliminated in the first round of counting. If you did not rank anyone else after Mary J. Blige, your vote was not considered in the additional rounds, and we had about seven or eight other rounds after Mary J. Blige was eliminated, your vote 
was not factored in and would have been exhausted. And so what we don't want is for too many people to have their votes exhausted because they have not ranked. And again, um, Speaker Hasty talked about being a statistician. If you look at this mathematically, when you have so many candidates in a particular race, if you have eight, nine, 10, 11 people running for an office, the likelihood that someone is going to reach that majority threshold in the first round is highly unlikely. So these races are going to go a couple of rounds, and we want your ballot to stay active as long as possible. And that means ranking more than one candidate. Can I rank a candidate more than once? So it actually doesn't help your favorite candidate to rank them more than once. And again, this is thinking about how RCV works is based on elimination. So your vote is moving from one candidate to another, another because that first candidate was eliminated. Does it hurt my favorite candidate to have a second choice? So again, the answer is no. It doesn't hurt your favorite candidate to have a second, third, fourth, or fifth choice because your vote will only leave your first choice if they are eliminated from the race. And again, thinking about the mock election, if Shirley Chisholm or Ruth Bader Ginsburg were your first choice candidates, your vote never left them because they stayed in the race the entire time. Your vote will only move from your favorite candidate if they are eliminated from the contest. So some key things to remember, ranked choice voting is in effect right now for our local primary and special elections for the offices of mayor, comptroller, public advocate, borough president, and city council. You are now able to rank up to five candidates, including a write-in. You can also still vote for one person if you like. Um, of course, you don't have to worry now about wasting votes. Accidentally voting for someone you don't want to support. Again, if you don't like someone, do not rank them at all on your ballot. You also don't have to be concerned about splitting the vote. You could like several candidates who are running for the same office. Now you can rank them in order of preference. And of course, now moving forward, in all of our local offices, you don't have to be concerned with someone being elected with less than a majority of the support of the voters in that district. Now moving forward, we will have consensus candidates elected to our local offices. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for that information. It's so important for us to be informed voters. So I thank you again, um, Nicole Yearwood, for being on the battlefield for us and making sure we are all educated voters. Now we're gonna have live, no, not live, recorded greetings from Congressman Jamal Bowman and Assemblywoman Karinas Reyes. Immediately following that, we will have our small business presentation by Commissioner uh, Janelle Doris, along with his colleague, Miguelina Aristi, who is the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and Community Relations. Hello, everyone. It's Congressman Bowman here representing the 16th District of New York. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Delta Days in the Bronx. This is the second annual. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. You're going to have a great time and learn a lot. Peace and love. Thanks, everyone. I'm Assemblymember Karina Reyes, and I want to welcome you to the second annual Delta in the Bronx. Um, there are going to be great presentations today and conversations to engage us and stimulate our, our minds um, and to talk about issues that affect so many of us in the Bronx, um, but also as a rallying call to action this year uh, in the past two years have actually been uh, particularly difficult for our Bronx sites. And it is a, a welcome opportunity to connect, uh, albeit virtually, but to connect and to organize and plan for a bigger and brighter future for the Bronx. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for having us on today. Um, we're very excited to be 
uh, with the Deltas in the Bronx, Delta Days. Um, I wanted to take a moment to just uh, go through a few of our slides here so you can get a sense of what uh, SBS does and how we be able to help uh, the city and also how we're able to assist particularly uh, those in the Bronx throughout the pandemic, but also some of the things we have coming up and some special programs, particularly for black businesses. Um, I'll try to do this uh, in a very short span of time. So please bear with me, we'll get through it quickly. Uh, and then um, of course, we'll, we're here to answer any questions, additional questions you may have. Um, so uh, SBS, uh, we're an agency that uh, does three things. Um, we basically work with uh, New Yorkers to make sure that uh, they get jobs. We oversee the workforce programs, workforce centers uh, in the city. We have 18 of them, several in the Bronx. Um, also work with small businesses and uh, I'm sure that we're building a strong community of small businesses and of neighborhoods where we have corridors of small businesses where we work with those bids, merchant associations, chambers of commerces, et cetera, to make sure that they're providing the services needed uh, to uh, small businesses and communities across the city. These are the services that we provide at uh, SBS. Uh, bit for everything from business courses, which I'll show you a few later, incentive programs, uh, energy incentive programs, training, legal assistance, uh, I would say free legal assistance for businesses, um, you know, ways that you navigate government. Government can be very complex. We're working with folks to teach them how to navigate government and engage government, how to sell to government through our MWBE program. Uh, and of course, financing. Uh, number one issue that small businesses face is getting in the resources they need to actually fulfill their dream and purpose, and that's what we help them do. Uh, we also help uh, businesses recruit uh, through our Workforce One program. So we help about 100,000 New Yorkers every year uh, find jobs uh, or training or any type of uh, career development. Uh, that's uh, part of what our agency does. And of course, we certify all the MWBEs in the city, which we have about 10,500 now. Uh, so what have we been doing during the pandemic? Uh, we've been extremely busy. Um, I know if you've been following all the things we've been doing. Uh, SBS has over 100 programs. Um, before the pandemic, we added another 28 or so plus programs, and we have uh, several more that's coming out, which I'll talk about in a few. But this is a bit of what we've done, everything uh, from launching our open restaurants, open storefronts program to our MWBEs participating in the city's procurement process during the pandemic uh, to, you know, helping uh, launch our Shop Your City campaign, uh, you know, encouraging folks to shop locally. Um, also, we are helping entrepreneurs lower their cost, operating cost. Um, we put out the first in the nation, even before the federal government did, uh, loan and grant programs uh, where we're able to assist small businesses across the city. Uh, and we've done several more of those. We've got more to come. I'll talk about uh, in, in a minute. Um, and uh, working, we also working with, uh, you know, the city agencies to make sure that uh, small businesses have a chance to come back, but we're not part of the problem. And so we're removing the red tape, reducing the red tape. And then we're thinking about the future, uh, thinking about how do we rebuild with an equitable uh, lens. And that's what we're doing uh, with our programs here in the fourth bucket. So, so tons of programs, tons of opportunities uh, for participation. But certainly uh, during the pandemic, we've been extremely busy here at SBS. Uh, we also want to encourage folks, we're running a Shop Your City campaign, a buy local campaign right now, and I think it's great uh, that you all are on here. I think it's going to be fantastic for you to spread the word. Uh, you can take a photo and you get a chance to win a $50 gift card. Uh, you can upload that photo to our website, but the, we're doing all of this just to let folks know uh, that we really need to be a part of the solution for our small businesses, that they can come back based upon the engagement they get from our local community, from you and me, uh, buying and shopping local. So we're telling folks for the next 30 days, stay off of the big box store, stay out of them, find a local store uh, where you can support. So in our budget, we just announced, the mayor announced uh, several programs for our, our agency. Um, and uh, we're going to 
uh, release a hundred million dollar fund to help small businesses reopen and grow during the pandemic. So it's a loan program. Um, but we've again released uh, four grant programs and two loan programs already during the pandemic. Um, we're releasing. We're going to release this in the coming months, right after the budget. Um, another hundred million dollar uh, fund. We also are going to release a hundred million dollar grant program as well um, for small businesses. Um, and some of the particularly hardest hit industries like restaurants, arts, entertainment, recreation, food services, and accommodation. Uh, and then um, another one, uh, $50 million uh, focused on underserved communities. We know from the results that's coming out uh, from the federal programs um, uh, that was instituted uh, that LMI communities, low to moderate income communities suffered the most and got the least. And so we're focusing on uh, LMI communities, underserved communities, to make sure that they get uh, the, what they rightfully deserve. We're also um, going to be uh, increasing our uh, allotment for our grant programs for community-based organizations who work with small businesses. Uh, and so, and also, we're going to be uh, working to increase our commercial lease assistance program. Now, this is important. This program. Uh, you know, helps you negotiate with your landlord uh, for free. Uh, we also added a grant component to this program uh, recently, uh, and you'll be able to get, uh, um, you know, all kinds of legal assistance and support um, as you look to renew your lease or terminate your lease or work out whatever commercial lease issues that you have. And so we have this program available. Uh, we added another $10 million to this program um, it was uh, it's going to be up from 1.5 million. So it's a significant amount of investment over the next two years. Uh, and then we're also uh, working with our, uh, as I mentioned before, to cut the red tape and 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 make sure that businesses have an opportunity uh, to thrive and survive in the city. And so we have a five million dollars uh, that we put into our one-stop shop. We're going to be announcing this soon. Uh, where we're going to uh, help in small businesses expedite their inspections, licensing, permitting, all those processes, uh, making sure that uh, those businesses are looking to open or come back or able to do so quickly. Uh, and then uh, catalyzing job opportunities in emerging markets. This is big. You know, New York City, we know tech is a, is a rising uh, 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 industry, um, number one actually right now. Uh, right after that, we're seeing uh, health care. Um, right after that, we're seeing, uh, you know, green jobs. And so what we want to make sure that we are also preparing uh, workers for the jobs of the future. I started to talk about our Avenue NYC program that's grants to nonprofits. So that's here. We're sort of uh, adding dollars to that. And of course, we have our Shop Your City campaign investments there. So these are some additional investments we've made in our budget. Uh, one thing that we do here at SBS is education, business education, very, very important. Even now during this time, uh, everyone needs to know that uh, you know, these uh, resources are available to you. And so um, again, uh, if you go to our website, I believe Miguelina has put in and add in uh, uh, links into the uh, website, into the chat here of our website, you can get the dates where these programs will be available to you, where you can learn about all things related to reopening and also give you the resources, financial resources uh, and technical assistance and support that you need. Uh, the question was put forth to us, like what some of the programs that we offer. SBS has, uh, you know, these are just 20 programs. I mean, we have so many more uh, for small businesses. Um, everything from, you know, how to become an entrepreneur uh, to accounting and financing, uh, digital marketing, legal support, all these things. Uh, you know, right now, and particularly in the digital marketing side, um, you know, you cannot operate a business, viable business now without a website, without being digital. And so we want to make sure that we are optimizing the search engines, uh, a, a utilization of your name, your brand, and make sure that you do that. So we have free training for that on social media as well. We know uh, COVID brought everyone indoors. Folks weren't coming out as much. So everyone is really shopping differently. And so all these programs are there to support, of course, legal support we have 
um, uh, free support. All of this is free, by the way, for, for, uh, for business owners. I'll, I'll just quickly say about MWB certification. It's so important. Uh, the N MWBE program uh, is developed um, way back when Mayor Dinkins uh, was mayor. Uh, then the program was uh, abandoned for the next two decades. And so uh, when uh, Mayor de Blasio came in, um, in about a year or two after, I was, uh, I was working at a time for the governor, but then I was hired by the mayor to come down and uh, start New York City's program. And so we were able to do that and, and got out the door about, at least in my tenure, about $14.5 billion. And we doubled the number of certified firms to over 10,000 uh, firms now. And um, we are you know, really excited about that. We also tripled our utilization up from 8% to 30% um, right at the start of the pandemic. So as you can imagine, um, the challenges that the pandemic brought on also brought on some opportunities because MWBEs, as I mentioned before, were able to participate in the program to close to a billion dollars. Uh, so if you're certified with the city of New York, uh, look, you stand out as a vendor, you gain access to our services, you get uh, capacity building programs. Uh, and, and to me, most importantly, you get opportunity and you get to know when those opportunities are in the city and you can bid on those pro uh, programs, and projects. Um, uh, what forms are eligible? A for-profit business. We get a lot of questions about nonprofit, but a for-profit business operating in New York State uh, is very important. You got to be a part of a minority group, Black, Hispanic, Asian specific, uh, Pacific, uh, Asian Indian, and Native American, or a woman. Uh, and we're very excited that our program, uh, we do have all these groups, uh, and we're very excited about uh, the fact that there's over 10,500 firms now in the city. So the process, folks ask, is it complicated? Um, not really. We certify within six to eight weeks. That's the fastest, one of the fastest uh, certification processes uh, around. Um, and we also have relationships with other certifying entities that can expedite your paperwork with them to make sure that uh, you're getting the resources you need. Uh, if you uh, look into uh, apply, uh, just go to sbsconnect.nyc.gov. I think it's, uh, it's on the screen. Uh, you're able to just uh, create your account and start the certification process. You're going to sign a certification analyst who would also assist you. Uh, MWBE services, this is a question that we were asked to present on as well. So we do capacity building, mentorship, capital access, or financial resources and then, and then just straight technical assistance. All of this for MWBEs. Um, this was written into the city charter. So the MWBE program is in the charter. The Mayor's Office of MWBE, which I founded when I came to the city, uh, that is also written into the charter. So we have longevity and sustainability in these programs. And we just need folks uh, to continue to take advantage of it and uh, really uh, hold the city and our colleagues, ourselves, everyone accountable to make sure that there's equity in the distribution of the city funds in our procurement system. So very excited to end with this. This is BNYC Black Entrepreneurship. We did, a, we did an assessment um, uh, in two years ago now on, uh, with about 1,500 uh, businesses um, and there were Black owned across the city. You can go to the next slides, um, across the city. Uh, again, thank you. And we were able to um, uh, speak to these uh, business owners about four big things that they had on their, uh, their mind and what they needed to get in order to advance uh, entrepreneurship for Black New Yorkers. So one is access to capital. Uh, like me, many of them were denied access to, to loans from banks um, and had to go to CDFI, Community Development Financial Institutions, to uh, get that resources to run your business. So I understand that firsthand. And then also find the customers, entrepreneurs and operating their business, they struggle to find customers. How do we find people? They also wanna know about affordable workspace. New York City, as you know, that is a challenge. Uh, and then business guidance and support, so general technical assistance for them. So we launched BNYC uh, this past summer, um, uh, sort of a re not a relaunch, but the advancement of it, we launched with some partners um, Ernst & Young, we launched with um, Goldman Sachs uh, and, we, uh, and uh, MasterCard. 
who have been working with us throughout uh, to make sure that we make, uh, get uh, B, uh, Black entrepreneurs the resources that they need in order to survive. Look, New York City is 22, 23% Black uh, and only 3.5%. Um, it was 2% at the time we did the study, but 3.5% now are Black owned. That's about 7,000 businesses with employees. And that, as you can imagine, with 240,000 businesses in the city, uh, it's really not an acceptable amount. So we want to make sure that you know about this program. You can go to the next slide, please. You can know, know about this program and the report, and then you will be able to engage with us here uh, at SBS. Um, and we'll, again, put all the links in the chat. I think my time is up. I just want to stop there and thank you all for, uh, for your attention today. I did, I did a that pretty fast. Normally we have an hour or two to do these presentations. So we went through very fast. Hopefully it was informative uh, and the information we'll make sure that it's in the chat. This is Migalina's information. Uh, she'll be happy to work with you and please do reach out to our hotline. 62,000 businesses have already called our hotline during the pandemic. Uh, that's the number. We've helped them with everything from financing, how to reopen and also whatever additional resources uh, that we have. Thank you so much. Uh, give me the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you, Commissioner Doris. We appreciate all the information that you've given to us. And now we're gonna have a greeting from our very own Senator Jamal Ellie. Happy Delta Days. This is New York State Senator Jamal T. Bailey, probably representing the 36th Senatorial District, or as I like to call it sometimes, the 36th Chamber. Proud to be helping you out with getting the word out about Delta Days. Delta Days are so critically important. And, you know, I'm used to them being in person. I'm used to seeing the sisters of Delta Sigma Theta uh, Sorority Incorporated, the Bronx Alumni Chapter. I'm used to seeing you in person because you're omnipresent and ever present in the Bronx. Literally in the summer, there's not a block party or a street fair or a church event that I don't see the Deltas at. And that shows your commitment to community. Um, during COVID-19, you, you've been out on the front lines with food drives, making sure that our brothers and sisters did not go hungry. And with my office specifically, I wanna say thank you to the Bronx alumni chapter for buying so many amazing toys for so many young boys and girls so that they had a great Christmas. Um, COVID has hit us really hard. A lot of people lost jobs, but you didn't let them lose hope. You let us come together in the holiday season. And I wanna say thank you. I wanna say thank you also to a good friend of mine, one of, one of your sorors, if I can utilize a nomenclature as it were, Joy Knight. And Joy Knight, once upon a time, Joy and I were, 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 were members of the same organization, WDP. We didn't pledge incorporated, but now Joy has seen the light she has joined an amazing sorority. Um, and, and I think that she's made an amazing choice in terms of the actions that you all do. And it fits who she is and it fits who you all are. I, I've had the pleasure of, of, of fellowshipping and interacting with so many of you in, your, in the chapter. And I'm not gonna go start naming names now cause I'm gonna get in trouble if I start naming the names of the other sorors that I know in your amazing chapter, but you're all amazing. And the reason why you're all amazing is because you realize that the letters that you wear are significant. And they're not just significant in terms of being a member of, of an organization, they are significant in terms of community. You get the word out in a nonpartisan way, which sometimes I can't do, but great organizations like you can do that. You can talk about ranked choice voting and what it is and what it's not and how critical of an election it is. You can talk about small businesses and how we need to make sure that our small businesses who are the lifeblood of our community, that they continue to be funded talk about educational disparities. You're gonna talk about um, redistricting. You're gonna talk about so many different things in your Delta days. And the best thing about you is that you don't keep information to yourself. You share the wealth of information because knowledge is power. In order for us to be empowered, we must share the power with each other. So to the Deltas, I thank you today in all days. And maybe one day, you know, maybe one day I'll pledge. Probably not, but if I do, I'll let you know, I'll get your recommendations, but in all seriousness, I, I, I love and respect um, the members of the Divine Nine and, and I really appreciate what
what the Deltas do for the Bronx and beyond the Bronx, because reality is the arbitrary geographical lines that, that, that represent our districts and our cities and states and towns, life is bigger than that. And I think that your organization truly understands that. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And for you, I'm eternally grateful. Happy Delta Days 2021. I can't wait to see you in person again. Good afternoon or good morning. So good morning. Now we will be moving on to our COVID-19 update. And our first speaker is Dr. Torian Easterling. Dr. Easterling serves as the first deputy commissioner and chief equity officer at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Easterling has spent more than five years in a senior leadership role at the health department. Prior to serving as first deputy commissioner and chief equity officer, Dr. Easterlin served as deputy commissioner for the center of the Center for Health Equity and Community Wellness at the New York City DOHMH, where he oversaw programmatic work focused on reducing overall premature mortality and closing the racial gap on the top leading causes of preventable death. He also served as the Assistant Commissioner of the Department of Health Bureau of Brooklyn Neighborhood Health, where he helped advance key programming to, to address pressing concerns, including maternal deaths and gun violence. Dr. Easterling is a community physician committed to health equity, social justice, and movement building to achieve the health outcomes that all people deserve, both locally and globally. Dr. Easterlin holds a bachelor, bachelor of Science from Morehouse College, a Doctor of Medicine from Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, and a Master's of Public Health from the Ehan School of Medicine at Sinai in New York. He completed his residency in family medicine at Jamaica Hospital Medical Center in Queens, New York and a general preventative medicine residency at Ehan School of Medicine at Sinai in New York. And our second speaker is Dr. Ton Dr. Tanya Rogo. Dr. Tanya Rogo is a pediatrician who specializes in infectious diseases at the Bronx Care Health System, formerly Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center, where she serves as the Associate Program Director of the Pediatric Residency Program, as well as the Director of the Curriculum in International Child Health and the Resident Research Program within the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Rogo was born in Kenya and completed her undergraduate education at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and then graduated from the dual MD MPH program at Tulane University. She completed pediatric residency at Innova Fairfax Hospital for Children and fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases at Brown University. She is a board certified in both general pediatrics and pediatric infectious diseases. After fellowship, Dr. Rogo spent four years in Rwanda as Brown University faculty for the Human Resources for Health Partnership with the Rwanda Ministry of Health, where she helped develop the pediatric residency program at the University of Rwanda. In 2017, Dr. Rogo was the first recipient of the Velji Young African Leader Award at the Consortium of Universities for Global Health Annual Conference. 
Dr. Rogo currently serves as the secretary of the Manhattan Central Medical Society, a local chapter of the National Medical Association. She, she is also a member of two national committees, the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society and the International Affairs Committee and the Inclusion, Diversity, Access and Equity Task Force. So we welcome both Dr. Tanya Rogo and Dr. Easterlin with us today. And I believe that we will be starting with Dr. Rogo. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for inviting me back. Um, I um, was kindly invited last year um, by the Deltas to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm really excited to come today to talk to you about uh, advances we've made in the science um, that have led to the development of a vaccine against COVID-19. Um, that um, is rolling out right now worldwide and that will hopefully bring this pandemic to an end. So uh, I'm gonna start by first reviewing what a vaccine is. So vaccines help people get immunity against infection. And the goal of a vaccine is to create immunologic memory because we all have um, innate immunity and it kicks into action when you when it first sees uh, an infective agent, but the first time that it sees it, it takes a little while to kick in. But once it's seen it, it forms memory cells so that the next time that it sees the infection, it, come, it works quickly so that hopefully you don't actually get sick from the infective agent. And um, vaccines work by providing both individual protection, but also community protection. Vaccines help protect the people who get the vaccine, but also protect the people around them because some people cannot be vaccinated. It may be that they are not the right age. So for example, with young babies, they may need to be a certain age before they can get a vaccine, or someone may have a medical underlying medical condition that may have them be immune compromised, or maybe they're undergoing treatment for cancer um, and therefore are not able to get vaccinated. And so if the people who are healthy around them can be vaccinated, that helps protect the vulnerable people who cannot be vaccinated. And we call this herd immunity. And so to just show you in a picture form how herd immunity works, um, in this first picture, you see here the person in red who has entered a group of people um, and this person happens to be infected. And the people in blue um, do not have any immunity. And so what happens is this person in red is able to infect all the people in blue who are not vaccinated, while the people in the few people in yellow remain healthy. If on the other hand, you have herd immunity, then this person in red in a community of people who are vaccinated is, is infects less people because of the herd immunity that exists. So since December, um, we now have three COVID vaccines available in the United States. We're very privileged um, in living in a country um, that has had uh, an abundance of vaccines available. And um, the first two vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are, are mRNA vaccines. And I'm going to explain in the next couple of slides what that means. And for the Pfizer vaccine, right now, the youngest age that you can get the vaccine is age 12. Moderna is for those 18 plus. And for both vaccines, it requires two doses. Pfizer is, is 21 days between dose one and dose two. And Moderna is 28 days between dose one and dose two. The Johnson Johnson vaccine is the most recent vaccine that got emergency use authorization. Um, and this is an adenovirus vector vaccine. And I'll also explain in a minute what that means. And is authorized for use in age 18 and above. And um, it's only, required, uh, only requires one dose. So how do these vaccines work? So mRNA stands for messenger RNA. And it just like the word messenger, as you can imagine what that means, that what, that's what messenger RNA does, is that it sends a message to your cells to do something. So you think about it as being an email. Um, and so this particular mRNA is carrying instructions 
to your cells to make a protein that sits on the, on the surface of the COVID-19 virus called the spike protein. Once your immune cells receive this message, and um, your cells re receive this message, they make the spike protein, which is then taken up by your immune cells and induces an immune response that creates antibodies against the COVID-19 virus. And then the messenger RNA is then degraded and disposed of within hours. Messenger RNA is never incorporated into, DNA, into your own DNA. Um, it's completely de degraded. And to just go over this again in a picture form. So you have the spike protein that sits on the coat of the coronavirus. And so they could have coded the, a messenger RNA for this protein. They cover it with a lipid coating and they put it in the vaccine. So when it gets injected into someone, this messenger RNA is taken up by your cells, which read the message, make the spike protein, and then present these spike proteins to the immune system which then generates antibodies. For the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, on the other hand, this uses an, an adenovirus vector. So instead of messenger RNA to carry, to carry the instructions for the spike protein, it uses an adenovirus, um, which is a respiratory virus, and it's a weakened virus that cannot replicate. And to show this in picture form, so they take the instructions or the um, coding for making the spike protein, and they put it inside the uh, weakened adenovirus. They multiply the adenovirus, purify it, weaken it, and then put it in the vaccine that's done in, injected in the patient. This adenovirus enters your cell. Um, the instructions for the spike protein are read, which produces the spike protein presented to the immune system and the antibodies created, and then this adenovirus vector is completely destroyed. Do the vaccines work? Um, so the initial trials showed very good results. So for the clinical trials for the mRNA vaccines, it showed that in the group that received the vaccine, it lowered the chance of getting COVID-19 by 94 to 95%. For Johnson & Johnson, the preliminary data suggested an overall efficacy against symptomatic or having, any, having symptoms or being sick with COVID-19 to be 66%. But in terms of preventing hospitalization, the efficacy is 93%, which is excellent. And furthermore, when they looked at the group that got vaccinated more than 28 days after vaccination, they actually found that there was no COVID associated hospitalizations compared to the placebo group. So there's 100% protection against hospitalization greater than a month after receiving the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Are the vaccines safe? So the short-term safety data has been good. Um, these vaccines are classified as reactogenic. Reactogenic meaning that they will cause some side effects in majority of the people who receive the vaccine. I myself received the Moderna vaccine back in December and had a sore arm for uh, about three days, which is similar to when I got my tetanus booster, which is also classified as a reactogenic vaccine. And this is reflective of the very brisk immune response that they generate. Safety of vaccines in the United States are monitored through VAERS. VAERS stands for the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. And this is an existing national early warning system that has existed since 1990 that is set up to detect any possible safety signals with any vaccine distributed in the United States. And the way VAERS works is that providers are supposed to report any event that happens um, within days or even weeks after someone has received a vaccine, right? So, so if you get a vaccine and you go outside and faint, that gets reported to VAERS. And what they do is that they, they collect all of this information and then they look to see if there's particular signals um, that should make them take a closer look and sometimes pause the distribution of a vaccine. So um, in terms of safety events that have been reported with the vaccines, we're first going to discuss al allergic reactions. So um, anaphylaxis or allergic reactions were reported equally during the drug trials, I mean, during the vaccine trials between the placebo and the vaccine groups. But after the vaccine started to be distributed in the United Kingdom and the United States in December, reports emerged of vaccine recipients experiencing anaphylaxis shortly after receiving their first dose. 
And the leading suspect in causing these reactions is polyethylene glycol, which is a compound present in both vaccines. However, the, the, the occurrence of anaphylaxis was very rare, approximately one in 100,000 doses. And in comparison, um, in regards to penicillin, for example, one in 5,000 doses of penicillin will result in anaphylaxis, right? So there's a much lower rate of it with the COVID-19 vaccine. And so as a result, um, the current recommendation is that when the, the mRNA vaccine is given, it should include a 15 minute period of observation after vaccination, um, just to make sure that if anyone does have an allergic, allergic reaction, they can be treated immediately. And for those who have a history of severe allergic reactions in general, they're watched for 30 minutes. The next um, safety event um, that occurred, um, I'm sure you all heard of this because it led to a pause, temporary pause in the distribution of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And that was with blood clotting or thrombosis. So in April, there were six reported cases of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome, um, which was an incidence of about one case per million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. And all of the reports had been in adult women younger than age 50. And um, so they paused the distribution of the vaccine, they looked at the cases, and they did not see a pattern of risk factors that could predict who could have this happen or predict who maybe shouldn't get the vaccine. And in addition, the, in terms of risk of thrombosis, um, it's actually very low. So this is one case per million, um, risk of thrombosis with oral contraceptive pills in comparison is four to six per 10,000. And you should also be aware that having COVID-19 infection in itself is actually very high risk for getting blood clotting issues. So about 20 patients in 120 out of 100 patients who get COVID-19 end up having a, a blood clot or a thrombus. And so part of the management that we do with COVID-19 is to give people prophylaxis against thrombosis. So again, very low risk for thrombosis. The most recent safety um, signal that has come to light um, is associated, association with carditis or inflammation of the heart with adolescent patients with the mRNA vaccine. So since April, 2021, um, cases of myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle, and pericarditis, which is, which is inflammation of the tissue that surrounds the heart, have been reported after the mRNA vaccination in adolescents and young adults. None have been reported with the J&J &J vaccine. When they reviewed the cases, um, they saw that they seem to predominantly occur in adolescents and young adults age 16 and older, more often in males than females more often after the second dose and typically within four days of vaccination. However, um, the, the occurrence of carditis and vaccine recipients does not exceed more than the normal incidence of carditis that we see in adolescents. Um, as a pediatric infectious disease specialist, I can tell you that I, I see um, carditis that happens after viral infections in adolescents. It's not an uncommon thing that we see. And um, it appears that there doesn't seem to be an increased risk um, of getting the vaccine compared to normal incidents. So uh, I'm going to end this by um, saying or emphasizing why vaccination is so important. Um, I know that um, there may be people in the audience who may have had initial hesitation or may still have hesitation about getting vaccinated. And I think this is a very natural response whenever something new is developed. Um, the mRNA vaccine, um, the, the technology itself is not new, but the use of vaccination is new. But I can tell you that I think that it's actually revolutionary uh, because the ability to use mRNA and therefore quickly change the code um, is going to be very helpful in the future as we will have future pandemics. And vaccines are a very important tool that we use when we're trying to uh, fight an outbreak um, during a public health emergency. Right now, I would emphasize that vaccination is important in the United States because you may have heard of emerging variants and you may have heard what's going on in India right now with the India variant. 
And right now in the United States, our vaccines, current COVID-19 vaccines are protective towards the type of virus, COVID-19 virus that's circulating in the United States. So we need to take advantage of the window that we have and get as many people vaccinated as possible so that we can control the spread of the virus because the ultimate goal is for us to reach herd immunity so that we can end the pandemic. It's estimated that we need 80% of the population to be vaccinated in order to reach herd immunity. As of right now, about half of US adults in the United States are fully vaccinated. So we still have a ways to go. So I'm going to end here um, and segue to Dr. Easterling to talk about the vaccine from the Department of Health perspective. Thank you, Dr. Rogo. Good morning, good morning uh, to, the, to the ladies of um, the Bronx Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated chapter. Uh, it is a pleasure to be joining you all uh, for uh, the Bronx Delta Day. Uh, just bringing up my slides shortly. <clears throat> uh, I wanted to um, just jump right in and pick up on where Dr. Rogo left off, um, you know, starting where we are uh, giving an update on COVID-19 and then sort of uh, continuing the, the points around the vaccine, namely around uh, how we are really working uh, in New York City uh, to ensure access for all New Yorkers, and particularly for communities that have been hardest hit uh, by COVID-19. Um, what you're seeing here on the slide uh, just gives you sort of a snapshot, um, actually with for the last year, what happened as far as the cases and how we have seen uh, it sort of shape up uh, in certain neighborhoods. And so this is data as of uh, June 4th. And so uh, to, the, to the left of the slide is what we call a, an epidemiology curve. It gives you uh, sort of a snapshot of all of the cases that have happened uh, over time. Uh, and you'll see sort of the, the points where we had high number of cases, right? Uh, certainly uh, last year uh, in April, um, certainly having a, at our peak around uh, the mid April uh, of 2020, uh, and then seeing a resurgence uh, that started in November of last year and it extended uh, into the first quarter of this year, and we're now in the summer. Um, but certainly because of the vaccines and what you just heard from Dr. Rogo, having an additional tool in our toolbox has really allowed us to uh, be able to um, uh, slow this spread down. Um, we have saw a much longer um, resurgence in wave two, namely because of those variants. Uh, and we, we continue to see the presence of variants in New York City uh, they represent the majority of the cases, although uh, we are we are below our public health milestones uh, as far as cases, uh, percent positivity, hospitalizations, and death. And we are we are at the lows uh, as far as our percent positivity, which uh, in the city, which is amazing and uh, is really promising. Uh, but we're certainly not out of the woods yet. Uh, and to that point, when you look at the right side of the slide, you're looking at the map of New York City and by neighborhood. Uh, and what this reflects uh, is the seven day percent positivity uh, by neighborhood. Now, citywide, we are at the lowest, but we know that this city is a, city of uh, a tale of two cities. And so we need to be able to look at uh, the data by neighborhood so that we can inform our operations and better understand how we can support communities. We saw during the pandemic that black and brown individuals were more likely uh, to be exposed, have severe outcomes, uh, and die from COVID-19. And what you're seeing in that map is that although citywide, we are below 1% as far as uh, community transmission happening throughout the city, uh, in certain neighborhoods, we are above 1% uh, and, and sometimes a little bit higher than that. Uh, uh, and that means that we really need to ensure uh, that um, we are uh, continuing to do all the things that we need to do as far as all our prevention strategies, helping folks understand the importance of getting vaccinated because there is a correlation. Uh, the, the, the neighborhoods where you're seeing a darker red, a higher percent positivity, which uh, indicates community transmission of 
the SARS-CoV-2, which causes COVID-19, correlates where we're, we're seeing um, higher rates of unvaccinated individuals. Uh, and so that really is um, the important point uh, that I would say to take away from this slide of why we really need to make sure that we continue to message the importance uh, of getting vaccinated. Um, and so, you know, I, I just showed the, the map of the percent positivity, so cases. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see, uh, you know, lower parts of Manhattan um, that is shaded lighter, our percent positivity really low, uh, parts of Southern Brooklyn um, that has darker red um, uh, as well. You know, and then you sort of look at this map um, and you'll see that the, those are the neighborhoods, um, Northern Manhattan, I'm sorry, Lower Manhattan, where you have a higher rates of vaccination rates. Southern Brooklyn, you have lower rates of vaccination rates. Uh, Central, Central Brooklyn as well, lower vaccination rates. Also, we are seeing um, um, higher percent positivity compared to the city average. Uh, and as well as the, the South Bronx, uh, we also see um, uh, lower vaccination rates. Uh, and so, you know, as uh, we have begun our vaccine distribution rollout, as the city has rolled this out, we have kept equity uh, at, at, at front and center. Uh, and we really knew that communities, uh, communities of color, low-income communities, had already been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Um, and that's not, you know, due to biological or genetic factors, but that's really due to the structural inequities that existed before COVID-19. Uh, and so making sure that one, we acknowledge the historical and contemporary injustices around government and medical mistrust. Uh, knew, we knew that, you know, in the beginning, because supply uh, certainly uh, was um, much lower and the demand was much higher, and now supply outstrips demand, um, we're going to have more of a challenge now to make sure that we get folks vaccinated because we're really um, in, in the space of trying to engage individuals, provide factual information, really support those who are uh, watchful uh, and waiting. Um, on a more positive note, uh, you'll see uh, the insert at the bottom of the slide that shows that the majority of adult residents in New York City um, has at least one dose. And so we are over 60% uh, of adult residents with at least one dose. And so uh, it has been, um, you know, a Herculean effort uh, by all of my city colleagues and our healthcare partners and uh, many of our community-based organizations really doing a lot of uh, engagement, uh, making sure that we built, built out an infrastructure that increased our access points, getting the message out around the importance of getting vaccinated. Uh, but we certainly have uh, more work to do. Um, as I've already shared, you know, for populations that have been eligible for months now, we still have to continue to get uh, folks vaccinated. As you've heard from Dr. Rogo, you know, health experts have said that for us to get to herd immunity, we need to be between 70 and 80 percent. We're not there yet. Uh, and so we, we still have more work to do. And we, we certainly know that uh, this phase is really trying to do a lot of that engagement. Um, and to get there, you'll see uh, on the right hand side, vaccination of New York City adult residents by race and ethnicity. Uh, you know, reporting race and ethnicity, collecting demographic data, uh, really allows us um, to inform our operations and understand where the inequities exist. And when we're seeing uh, that in New York City, Black and Latino uh, vaccination rates for at least one dose or fully vaccinated continues to lag behind other, other groups, um, certainly uh, we need to figure out you know, as, as a government, you know, what work we need to do, what we continue to do to really support uh, uh, individuals getting vaccinated. Um, and so those are the, the populations 18 over who've already, already been um, eligible. Uh, and now uh, uh, children 12 and older are eligible as well. And we're starting to see those inequities and those lags as well. And we need to continue to uh, keep our uh, foot on the gas to make sure that we're supporting individuals to know where they can get vaccinated uh, and also to support them uh, on messaging. Um, and so we've launched our campaign in, in December or early on, really making sure that we were messaging that the vaccines are safe, uh, they're, they're effective uh, and they're life-saving. Um, 
uh, as I've already mentioned, uh, you know, children 12 and older uh, can now get vaccinated. Uh, just yesterday, uh, I was at Coney Island uh, at the aquarium uh, and really having these type of partnerships ensure that we can provide access. And so in partnering with the Coney Island uh, Aquarium, we're offering uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, six days a week. Uh, and we're making sure that uh, children uh, 12 and older can get vaccinated and partnering with the aquarium and the wildlife conservation uh, society also uh, providing incentives and so uh, families can receive uh, tickets for a future visit um, uh, if they get vaccinated on site there at the at the aquarium uh, and so it's it's these partnerships that have been really really important um, making it accessible and easy and so allowing individuals to walk up uh, to get their get get a vaccine has been really important. Making sure that we have uh, interpreters, uh, that all of our signage uh, is translated in multiple language. Um, uh, making sure that our website is also uh, has translation service as well. Uh, and so individuals can still schedule appointments either on our website vaccinefinder.nyc.gov, or by calling eight seven seven vax for NYC. Uh, transportation, free transportation uh, is still being provided uh, for New Yorkers. Uh, and, it, and, that's, um, and even if you're going to a state site, even if you're going to a pharmacy or another site that's not city run, you can still get free transportation uh, by calling that number. Uh, and so we want to, again, continue to make this as easy as possible. Uh, and, and you've already heard uh, from Dr. Rogo. Uh, sort of the science and the data and you know i saw there was a question that popped up uh, you know as we were transitioning here um, there i think the important part around engaging individuals and really beginning to encourage people to get vaccinated um, you, it's going to have to be um, an ongoing engagement um, and sometimes it's going to take multiple engagement uh, to really help someone understand how important this is um, the 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 um, baseline message of if is of it's a safe, effective, and life-saving is important. Um, also, addressing any uh, uh, misinformation that that person may have. But I always say starting from a place of openness and listening is really important. Uh, and as physicians, uh, that's that's where we start from. We have to listen and understand where the person is coming from and why there there are questions and concerns because those concerns are valid uh, and. Uh, and having this vaccine developed on the pace that it has been developed, I think that we have to validate those concerns uh, as well. Um, just wanted to give you a snapshot of the progress that has been made, uh, not only in New York City, but uh, across the country. Uh, and certainly uh, this has been, um, you know, a really unprecedented uh, collaboration um, by federal, state and local jurisdictions. Um, but not just, uh, as I mentioned, government partners, but you know, non-government partners as well, healthcare institutions, really making sure uh, that we were able to marshal all of our resources, open all of our doors, leverage all of our staff to really make sure that we can support individuals getting vaccinated. Uh, and so I think this, is, uh, this has been a true testament of how we can use our collective power. Uh, but as I said, uh, you know, we, we certainly have uh, more work to do. And so uh, continuing to provide access to the vaccines uh, is um, is a priority. Um, there are over 700 public access points to vaccines in New York City. Um, we continue to support our providers, uh, making sure that physicians uh, in New York City, uh, you know, are either vaccinating or we're supporting those physicians uh, to uh, to get their patients uh, vaccinated uh, because we know that our community providers, our primary care physicians, our pediatricians, our family doctors. Um, our internal medicine docs are really important in being trusted messengers and, and really encouraging their patients to get vaccinated. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned a number of these things. The only thing I did not mention uh, is our homebound vaccination program, which is still running. Uh, we have now opened it up uh, and including um, all of our older adults. And so if any older adult wants to get vaccinated and prefer to have someone come to their home to get vaccinated, uh, you can sign up. Um, either calling the number 877-VAX4-NYC uh, or uh, I can drop the link in the chat uh, once I've completed here. Um, and so, you know, really access, uh, as I mentioned, is a priority. Um, 
keeping equity uh, front and center uh, priority um, and certainly building uh, trustworthiness around the vaccine um, as part of our uh, vaccine confidence work uh, is also a priority. Uh, when you talk about vaccine hesitancy, uh, then the onus feels like it's on the individual. Uh, but given uh, you know the, the history of medical mistrust, uh, current injustices that do, are still happening in our healthcare system, the pace in which the vaccines have been developed, uh, which certainly has, um, has caused concern uh, and, and increased our uh, uncertainty around biomedical interventions. Um, again, we have to ensure that we're shifting that onus on institutions like governments and healthcare systems to really make sure that we are building the confidence uh, around how systems can work, how they can really keep people safe and um, ensure uh, that we're protecting their health. And so um, we're really making sure that both the message is clear and the messengers who are carrying that message out are available. Uh, and we've been working in a number of different ways to do that uh, by working with community-based organizations, faith-based leaders, also working with our healthcare systems to make sure that they are carrying that message forward, not only to their patients, but also to their staff, because we need to ensure uh, that many of our healthcare leaders, our healthcare staff are also getting vaccinated as well. Um, we've been doing a number of different uh, uh, platforms and venues to get the message out, uh, town halls, community conversations. We're training community-based organizations on how they should be talking about the vaccine, making sure that they have uh, the talking points, uh, doing a number of different call to actions with employers and providers and also faith leaders uh, as well. And we're gonna continue to do this all throughout the summer. We're doing activations uh, with uh, you know, um, uh, black and Latino providers. We are at a number of different events. Uh, you know, this weekend, uh, I'll be at a playground, um, really making sure that we're messaging uh, the importance of our getting vaccinated and particularly trying to engage uh, our young folks. Uh, and uh, you, you, you may have seen a number of our, our PSAs uh, in our radio ads, really making sure that we're getting uh, the message out. Uh, and so uh, I think that we are um, uh, certainly um, doing a number of different things, but there's always ways for us to grow. And so really, uh, if there are any suggestions, I'm uh, happy to take them. Um, I think it's also important to just share uh, what we mean by being fully vaccinated. Uh, as uh, there are a lot of questions, you know, once I receive my first dose, uh, if, if I'm getting uh, an mRNA vaccine, whether Pfizer or uh, Moderna, what does that mean? Uh, what is it, when am I fully vaccinated? And so the definition of fully vaccinated is two weeks after your second dose of an mRNA vaccine. So after Moderna, Pfizer vaccine for your second dose, two weeks after that, that second dose or two weeks after your, uh, the, the one dose for Johnson & Johnson, you are considered uh, fully vaccinated. Before then, uh, you need to continue to do all the protections as if you were unvaccinated. And so even after, um, uh, even after you receive your first dose, you should be doing all of your core four uh, prevention. Uh, you've already heard from our speaker, uh, from Speaker Hasty, about you know after the first dose, he was still uh, um, exposed and uh, to COVID-19. And so, really, just a reminder that one, we need to do all these things uh, until we're fully vaccinated. But even being fully vaccinated, we have to remember that no vaccines are 100%. Uh, and so, we want to continue to do all the things that we have to do to to, to just. Uh, be mindful and vigilant. And so our core four, staying home, uh, if you're sick, keeping physical distance, washing your hands, and wearing a mask uh, in most settings. Um, and would also continue to say getting tested if you are unvaccinated. Now, what can you do if you are fully vaccinated? Um, and so, you know, gathering indoors without a uh, face covering or, or physical distancing is possible, particularly with other fully vaccinated people. Um, that, that's certainly fine if you're with unvaccinated people from a single household uh, and they have um, they're at low risk for severe COVID-19 illness. Um, I really want to emphasize because, you know, uh, when you think about uh, who uh, is really low risk for severe COVID-19 illness, yes, uh, children um, would fall in that category, <clears throat> but certainly you need to remember, you know, that age uh, is a risk factor for severe COVID-19 illness. Anyone with an underlying chronic condition, 
um, is, uh, is at risk for severe COVID-19 illness, plus anyone who lives with anyone who falls in those other two categories also um, uh, wouldn't be at low risk because they can be carriers and bringing that back into the home, particularly if those individuals are unvaccinated. So really just want to make sure that you sort of just really mindful um, of how easily, uh, you know, this can really not only impact uh, the individual, but someone uh, that may be in their household. Uh, and so you also know that, you know, gathering outdoors um, is a low risk activity. And so uh, that that's really um, important. Uh, just, I think, you know, just the, the end of the message is, you know, there's a lot of work that we can continue to do and really want to support, uh, you know, um, uh, this chapter and continue to help with this messaging and getting it out, uh, supporting any vaccination outreach effort that, uh, that the, the chapter can do. Uh, really look forward to, um, you know, further engagement and further ways that we can partner. Uh, and uh, I thank you for the time. So thank you so much to Dr. Easterlin and Dr. Rogo for providing us with that much needed information on COVID-19. So I will now turn it over to the chair of the Social Action Committee for closing remarks, Teresa Landlock. Thank you to my co-chair, Janelle Boyd. I wanna thank everyone for coming out today so that you can hear about COVID-19, ranked choice voting, and of course, small business support services. So I want you to remember these things. June 22nd is our primary day. Make sure you educate yourself about the different candidates that are on the ballot because we all know that local politics is important. Don't just randomly choose someone, but remember that ranked choice voting gives you the choice of voting up to five candidates. So please be selective with who you vote for. I also want you to remember that the Small Business Services Program has over 28 different initiatives to support local businesses in the Bronx. I know that COVID-19 had many of our businesses shut down. So please take advantage of their services and find out how they can help you with the different grants they have or loans. Don't forget they also have free training for those of you who would like to become entrepreneurs. So check out their website at sbs.com.nyc.com. And finally, Dr. Rogo and Dr. Easterling, I cannot thank you enough for giving us an update on COVID-19 and what it means to our community. It is so important for us to try to get to that herd immunity and each one of us has to do our part by getting vaccinated. I could not do this without my committee. So I have to thank the Social Action Committee for your support and I also would like to thank Madam President for allowing us the freedom to make these choices and create these programs. And we could not have done any of this without our wonderful technology and publicity committee. Um, Crystal Goldburn, you are a genius and I cannot thank you and your committee enough. So with that said, I thank you guys for giving us your attention this morning and have a wonderful day.